So your doctor says to you, get more rest, exercise, and sleep. Lose some weight, reduce stress in your life, and you say, yeah, but can I have a Xanax? Uh huh. Or I say that. We say that. There's some version of that. If you take a look at what's happening on commercials, and they're selling symptom relief. It's, it's theologically uh, a way, what I would call a theology of glory, is that you can stay just the way you are, but I, re I will reduce your symptoms or eliminate the headache so that you can continue living too fast, drinking too little water, being too concerned about things, so that you can continue on in your lifestyle that you've chosen, which is killing you, but symptom-free. <laughs> All right. I think that's the struggle that is at the core of this message and this incident and this event in Jesus' life. And it happens in the Gospel of Mark. Um, welcome to Thrive. Uh, the sign outside says, you belong. And I want you to know that you do belong here that uh, I've recently been coming here a while myself as a retired pastor, and I'm honored and, uh, to uh, just give John a little, little break every now and again and to uh, bring the word of the Lord. And uh, I can promise you this is a place that once, if you don't belong, do belong. But I understand there's, a, there's always a test, stress and attention in that too, right? You, you want to belong, but do I want to belong to these people? I don't know. <laughs> Try a uh, Thrive Hangout. Uh, far beyond John's thing, you'll discover that there is community that uh, God has prepared for you here. So welcome, and uh, we'll, we'll welcome back Pastor John next week after we don't let him have too many weeks in a row. So he'll be back. <coughs> Seeking symptom relief, receiving something better. This is this text. So this is the full movie. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, the Logos. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. When they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. When they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to them, Son, I love that, Son. Your sins are forgiven. Some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Their hearts, not out loud. And immediately, remember that's Mark's favorite word, and immediately, there he goes again, immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit, they had thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Here's our question. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, right? Here we go. You may know the Son of Man has authority on earth. He said, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them. So they were all amazed and glorified with God saying, we never saw anything like this. Which, by the way, as, you, as Pastor John and I unfold the Gospel of Mark, you'll see that's another common theme. People go, who is this guy? <laughs> it's like, what? Who ever heard of somebody stopping the weather pattern? Who ever heard of somebody curing a paralytic, touching a leper? Who is this guy? Even at the very end of the book, it has a very, very different resurrection story. And the women went away terrified. I'm sorry, I might be taking John's thunder, so we won't go too far ahead. Point of that is, that's a common theme in John, is rather than people going, oh, that's Jesus, they go, who is he? How does this work? This is crazy. He captures their attention. He holds it fast. Have you seen the, or heard of the movie called The Chosen? It's a series of things the church is doing. They've got a different, they've got a phrase in there that I like 
called uh, Get Used to Different. That's kind of what the Gospel of Mark is kind of saying, is like Jesus is kind of coming at a tangent. And, and rather than people going, oh, finally the Messiah is here, they're going, what? And the same thing, that we never saw anything like this. To which you and I in the 21st century would go, duh. So what we have to start with is really what I would talk about, the systemic nature of sin. And the reason why that's important is because a thorough understanding of the nature and the comprehensive understanding of sin is critical to the understanding of the answer to, that Jesus gives to the question. And it's really important that when we talk about symptom relief versus lifestyle change, versus being changed from the inside out rather than the outside in, the, it's really important to understand the pervasiveness of sin. And, even within our culture, there's sort of a mild to moderate to, to sometimes hard pushback because the word sin can sound fundamentalistic or uh, sinner or something. And, well, it's missing the mark. It's not being able to get there from here. It's, it's falling short. And just a little bit of reflection in each of us would say, uh, I don't make it in all areas. Anyway, systemic nature of sin. Shame or guilt overwhelms the soul. We became trapped in our perspective. So the original sin, which occurred in the, in the Garden of Eden, meant that we became trapped. Now, all of a sudden, with my separation from God, my disobedience to God, the, I don't see the world through his eyes. I see the world through my eyes. And we know what that looks like. It's implied. It's so pervasive in our lives that we will often miss it. And, and again, if you use the example of a little fender bender occurring in the middle of an intersection, four people standing on each, all around on each corner, and you ask in an interview everybody what happened in the accident, how many, if there's four people who are interviewed, how many perspectives do you get? Four. One event, four perspectives. It's a simple and silly example to illustrate that all of this original sin has trapped me in I can't see beyond Carl Gaelic's perspective on things. I can share my opinion, and as you get to know me, you know I'm not afraid to do that. <laughs> but it's still my perspective, not God's. Paul would say in Romans chapter 7, the good that I want to do, that I can't do, that what I don't want to do, I end up doing, ah, it's driving me crazy. Anybody here, and don't raise your hand, this is an implied question, did anybody here ever try a diet? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? That's your own perspective. It's like, the good that I would, arr, and then can't get there from here, fall short, miss it out. I am trapped in the fact that that looks really good. The land itself was cursed and laced with frustration. St. Paul would say, creation groans, longing to be freed from its bondage to decay. So the land no longer produced the natural results of God's creation, but when you separated from God, then what happened was creation itself is affected. We also still know this to be true, right? Because we change things as humans, and it affects our planet. Without getting into any sort of discussions, and we make decisions, we do things which aren't necessarily good for creation itself, and then creation gives us problems, and then we get caught up in the struggle. The pain of childbirth illustrated the intergenerational effect, punishing the sins of the fathers of the third and fourth generation. So sin does not only occur in my generation, but when I sin, it has generational effect on my children. Some of you may know I studied marriage and family therapy and, and have done an in-depth study of something called intergenerational transmission. I did it on our family, and I found in our own personal family, my great-grandpa was kicked out of the house someplace in Czechoslovakia. Nobody's exactly sure why. My, so he was, he was not given shelter or a house or home or a family. He made it somehow to um, Chicago, and my grandpa there um, was alcoholic and problematic, and he gave birth to my, my dad. My dad was raised by an alcoholic um, father. I mean, if you know anything about alcoholic families, you know, there's his own set of issues. 
So he gave him a shelter and a house, but not love and intimacy. Then my dad gave birth to me, obviously. Well, no, my mom really did. <laughs> and my mom's sitting there going, wasn't your dad? <laughs> mom and dad, sorry, mom, for lack of credit there, gave birth to me. And then I was one step further removed from that. But the sins of the fathers had affected this. So dad and I had difficulty growing close. Fourth generation, now my sons come along, and they were given shelter, home, love, intimacy, and aren't aware of the struggles of the previous generations. It took four generations to figure that out. It took four generations to wash that through the Gaelic household. Sin has intergenerational effect. I learned in marriage and family, and then we'll go on from this kind of thing, that the nature of it is profound and profuse and phenomenal. That emotionality alters physiology. That's sort of a large word or way of saying your experiences actually alter your physiology, your brain chemistry. And it all gets passed down in ways that are incredibly difficult to define and, dis and discern. Point of this all, it's original sin systemic effect. It's, it's worse than you think. Jesus kind of gives us the theological from Mark chapter 7. He said, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For from within, out of a man's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and they defile a person. Gee, Jesus, did you miss any? He's trying to give us the pervasive effect of sin. James will kind of do that too. The desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, brings forth death to show this way in which it gets worked into life and is connected to death itself. Desires give birth to sin. Sin is fully grown, brings forth death. And this one has always bothered me. You must therefore be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Say what? That's Sermon on the Mount. Now, it's important to understand the word there for perfect isn't the one that we would have that I would try to get on my ACT and never came close. <laughs> Not a perfect score, but teleos, teleological, complete, whole, made absolutely complete or whole, more than perfect. Raise your hand if you're complete or whole. You know, me neither. So not only is it systemic and not only is it problematic, we're a long way down the tubes. Hmm. This is what creation may have looked like in goodness, though, is right? There's no picture of the garden, so I don't know if this is real. I'm just looking for a metaphor, an image to kind of lock into our hearts and heads. And this is what we end up producing. And this is you and me trying to clean it up. That's called works righteousness. That's trying to figure it out on our up the mess of our lives on our own. And it's just it's so futile. Oh. Gee, thanks for the wonderful, delightful, eerie sermon start, Pastor. We ache for symptom relief while Jesus offers complete and eternal healing. So let's, let's move on to the good news. You and I are trapped in this systemic effect, this vortex, this darkness, and this interaction of soul, body, mind, family, intergenerations, and all of that going on all the time. And do we really need a 24-hour news cycle to tell us anymore? We get it. Jesus says, oh. Let's get at the heart of it. Let's get at the soul of it. Let's get at the deep part of it. So to the question, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven. Now, it seems easier to say your sins are forgiven because there's no visible manifestation. So you could walk up to somebody and go, your sins are forgiven. And they would say, thank you, but I think I look and feel the same. You might feel different and even walk different for a while, but... 
no necessary visible manifestation. You don't have less acne. You don't not walk with a limp, whatever that is. But the problem is, however, according to Jesus' enemies, only God can forgive. So in their Talmud, in their theological journals, it said, only God can forgive sins. Not even the Messiah, can, that was in there. Not even the Messiah, when he comes, will be able to forgive sins. So Jesus, keenly aware of that, steps back with that in mind and goes, your sins are forgiven. What? Thus all the murmuring of the guys who are draped in their uniforms. So what Jesus is claiming is divinity. He's claiming he is God, making it the harder thing to say. He could have told the crowd gathered in the corner, by the way, I'm God. <laughs> Nobody would have bought it. Now he steps back and says, your sins are forgiven, claiming to be God. And then I'm going to show you, claims even more as he firms that thesis up. So it looks like it's easier to say, well, your sins are forgiven is the easier thing to say. But in this context, it's actually the harder thing to say. Rise up, take your bed, and go home is actually easier because divinity isn't required. It can be dismissed as a parlor or trick or magic act. That guy really wasn't ill. It can be questioned and labeled as spontaneous remission. This comes from a time in my ministry when um, I was uh, pastoring a congregation. I'll keep it vague. And uh, there was a family who came to me, and their daughter was not claiming she wasn't Christian. And, and um, they were struggling with that, but it had a brain tumor. And that was particularly alarming because they thought the brain tumor was going to kill her. And so they wanted to try to find a way to assure her of her salvation. And she was resistant to that. Well, they went in, and the family had been praying and laying hands, asking for God to relieve the, sim the symptom and cure the tumor. And uh, they do a final MRI, X-ray, whatever they do right before they go into surgery. And guess what they found? <coughs> Nothing. So the parents and many of the people in the congregation were, were overjoyed and thanking God and giving out hallelujahs. The girl said, it's just spontaneous remission, because that's what it said on the medical document. So part of the issue that I have, then, is that miracles, as mighty and as powerful they are, sometimes are parlor tricks <laughs> with people, right? On the other hand, even when they're not parlor tricks, they are not necessarily convincing, because, come on, a reasonable person would accept what you just saw. Dismissed as spontaneous remission of what sort or another. So, so that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. We need to talk about the Son of Man. The Son of Man, according to Daniel chapter 7. Jesus is calling himself the Son of Man. The title he gave himself more than any other. He was called by others Christ more often than any other title. But when he addressed himself, he addressed himself as Son of Man. Why? Because from Daniel chapter 7, Daniel, the Son of Man is called a heavenly being. He's appointed to be the judge of the earth. He's given God's kingdom to reign forever and descends from heaven and ascends back to heaven. Well, that sounds like Jesus. <laughs> so when Jesus says, calls himself Son of Man, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those who are opposing him are going, what? You're calling yourself God and thinking you can't forgive sins? You are identifying with the Son of Man himself? But if Jesus can forgive sins, he is God. If Jesus is God, you're not. Now, that's silly because how profoundly and amazingly true that is. In my confession, I have to, commit, I have to confess and say, I want to be God. Remember what Jim, was it Jim Carrey who wanted to be God in the movie long ago? I forget the name of that movie. What was the name of that? We're not going to show clips of Bruce Almighty. But that's kind of the point is... 
if Jesus is, is God, I'm not. If I'm not God, then I am totally dependent. This is true in a lot of different areas. It's true in creation, too, right? Because no matter where you are as an evolutionary biologist or a creationist, when you go backwards over space and time and land up there, there comes a point, there comes a place, there comes a time when something has to be created from nothing. But you'll find that scientists will often ignore that phenomena because if something was created from nothing, then somebody had to exist in the nothingness and get everything rolling. What I've read as I've studied this, just the top percentage of it, is the causative agent. There was a causative agent. That's like spontaneous remission. I think. I've yelled at the screen, and Mary Louise has come running to make sure I'm okay. Just say God! <laughs> but they can't, and they won't. Because if you're not God, then you're totally dependent on who he is, what he says, what he does. If that paralytic man stands up and walks out of there, you've got some very difficult choices to make. You can ignore him and pretend it didn't happen. You can be too busy. None of us have gone that route. We can demonize and destroy him so you don't have the tension. It was just a show. He's just showing off. He set the whole thing up. Or you can believe him and surrender to him as God. Have you surrendered to God? You said, my life, my soul, here's one that's going to sting. My income, my money, it's all yours, God. Do it what you want. Even as I say that, can you just feel yourself go, Rrr. and yet when we pray the Lord's Prayer together, we say those words, right? Thy will be done. But I say them fast enough that I don't really mean them. <laughs> I just remember the prayer. If he is God and he does and can and did forgive sins, if he's the son of man, I am totally dependent on him, and everything changes. <coughs> Many of us are afraid to surrender because we think this is what surrender is. <laughs> An ecclesiastical SWAT team is going to burst through our door. <laughs> you must surrender! <laughs> what did you do? Tell us your sin! And again, by way of hyperbole, I'm saying, yet that's kind of what it is. How many of us can really open up to a loved one, much less ourselves, much less to God, and say, I give up? You don't know what surrender looks like from God's perspective? That's what it looks like. Jesus said, I'm going to show you surrender. Here's surrender. I know you're afraid of surrender, Jesus might say. <coughs> it's tough. Thy will be done. Jesus would also add the narrative. I've been there, done that in the Garden of Eden. That even after the Father and I made this plan since before time, I knelt there and went, oh, man. Why would Jesus, after making the plan for all this time, go to the Garden of Gethsemane and have doubts and fears right at the last moment. Because we haven't a clue what was about to happen. The darkness and the disease and the systemic effect of sin and the devil's playground and the bitter pill that he was to swallow is unimaginable. And I think Jesus says to me is, Carl, that's the gift. <laughs> you don't have to imagine it. I got it. I took it. I screamed to the Father. He abandoned me. And the reason why I did that was for you. That's surrender. I surrendered so you would find eternal life. I surrendered so you would know that not only am I God, but I've called you to be with me. You are totally dependent on me, and that's your strength. That's surrender. Thank you, Jesus. The power of forgiveness won now gets distributed. It is finished. Now, what somebody who's dying on the cross might choose to say is, I'm done. I'm, 
It's finished. He goes, it is finished. Telestai. Telestai. To telestai. What did God do? Is now the payment for my sin and its whole systemic effect has been whoosh, wiped clean. Paid a price beyond my imagination. It's all done. Now we've got to find a way to pass it out. Jesus said to them again from John chapter 20, The risen Lord, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so am I sending you. So there's a sending. There's a calling. When he said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. The power of forgiveness, which was seen only to come from God, comes from the Christ who pays the price and the penalty and distributes it to us, you, his church. How? All I have to do is reach down deep and really find a way to be... No. <laughs> Receive the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in baptism, in communion, in his word, and receive that power that I won and gave to you. That's where that forgiveness comes from. Confession as surrender. We have opportunity each week, each day to confess. This is a confession often found in liturgies, Lutheran, Episcopal, and uh, others that I know of, Presbyterian. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Our confession is holistic, systemic, saying, yeah, it's not this one thing. There is this one thing. There's more than one thing. There's, there's things, but it's effect. It's my participation. It's my perspective. It's my life. And that's what I'm guilty of. And the Lord says... Which is easy to say. Which do you say? I can never forgive that. Careful. I can forgive but never forget. That's a longer story in a different sermon. <laughs> oh, don't worry about it. It's fine. That's actually one of my favorites. It's fine. Or your sins are forgiven. And how often do we say that? I forgive you. Your sins are forgiven. And yet that's what Christ won. That was the answer to the question in a crowded house in Capernaum. Your sins are forgiven. <coughs> and it was simply, wholly, completely, fully, wonderfully because of Jesus. In his name, amen.